Napoleon Bonaparte, one of history's greatest commanders, or a bit overrated. In this video, I'm going to explore the pivotal battles that shaped the legendary commander's legacy and left an indelible mark on the pages of history. From his sweeping victories at Marengo and Austerlitz to the disastrous Russian campaign and the iconic Battle of Waterloo. We're going to revisit the epic clashes, analyse the strategies and witness the drama and chaos of the biggest battles that shaped Napoleon's rise and fall. This was the battle that put Napoleon on the map. Amid the chaos of the French Revolution, the 24-year-old artillery officer found himself in the right place at the right time. The city of Toulon, with its natural harbour, was the headquarters of the French Navy in the Mediterranean. It had been seized by royalist counter-revolutionary forces and with the support of the British Royal Navy and other allies from overseas. It was an existential threat to the government in Paris and it placed the whole revolution in jeopardy. The Committee of Public Safety, the de facto government in revolutionary France, knew they had to regain control of Toulon and they scrambled together a force to besiege the city. Among the men pressed into service was Napoleon Bonaparte, who just happened to be in the area. Napoleon, despite being a lowly captain in his 20s, would play a decisive role in the coming siege. Why? The answer, artillery. Now, besides his unwavering commitment to the revolutionary cause, which made revolutionary politicians trust him, Napoleon was an artillery specialist. He'd studied the use of cannon at the most prestigious military school in Paris. He'd showed great promise from the get-go. The normal course of study for artillery at the school was two years, but Napoleon, who'd worked hard and excelled in much of what he did, was able to graduate after just a single year. The enemy at Toulon held a chain of forts overlooking the harbour and the city. With his trained eye, Napoleon realised that if he could capture one particular cluster of forts, he could place his own cannon there and then stop any ships getting in and out of the harbour. And the British, their allies and the Royalist French would starve. From September 1793, Napoleon worked feverishly to build up enough cannon and the men to use them. He scoured the countryside for old guns. He went to work trying to create new ones. Anyone with experience was dragged out of retirement to help. Infantry were retrained as gunners. The enemy were in a seemingly impregnable position, but this fact did little to deter the young officer with grand ambitions. Through November, Napoleon built up a series of powerful batteries that spat iron and fire at the enemy. On the night of the 16th of December, the French assaulted the chain of forts. Napoleon was in the front line. He was stabbed in the thigh by a British sergeant, but by morning the French flag was waving above the forts. The enemy had retreated. Quickly, Napoleon turned the guns of the captured forts to fire upon the ships coming in and out of the harbour. The British Royal Navy had no option but to pull back out of range. The French ships in the harbour were burned, as were the dockyard facilities, before the British and their Spanish and Italian allies evacuated the city. Napoleon's plan had led to a glorious French victory. I have no words to describe Bonaparte's merit, General Jacques Dugomier said during the siege. Much technical skill, an equal degree of intelligence and too much gallantry. It was a sign of things to come. The siege of Toulon was a decisive battle in Napoleon's career. It brought him to the attention of the French military and political leadership. His success at Toulon demonstrated his strategic acumen, tactical brilliance and unwavering commitment to the revolutionary cause. This early triumph paved the way for his meteoric rise up through the ranks of the French army, ultimately leading to his becoming one of history's most iconic military leaders. Through the 1790s, Napoleon established himself as France's greatest general. He routed the Austrians in Italy and he put down an uprising on the streets of Paris. In 1798, he launched his boldest plan yet. He wanted to strike a mortal blow against France's deadliest foe, the British, by invading Egypt and the Middle East. That would threaten Britain's empire in India, the source of so much of its wealth. I think he also imagined himself as a new Alexander the Great, 
conquering an empire in the east. He landed at the mouth of the Nile and headed south to Cairo, the jewel of Egypt. With the pyramids of Giza visible in the distance, Napoleon's army of roughly 20,000 soldiers were deep in enemy territory, plagued by disease and low on supplies. Facing these challenges, Napoleon devised a bold strategy to defeat the numerically superior Egyptian Mamluk forces led by Murad Bey and Ibrahim Bey. On the battlefield, Napoleon implemented the so-called divisional square. He formed his men into huge hollow squares that were protected on all sides, with their supplies safely in the middle. He knew the Mamluk cavalry was their most effective weapon, so he made sure his men would be able to fend it off as cavalrymen and horses struck in all directions. It was a masterstroke from the young general. The battle began with a massive French artillery barrage that inflicted heavy casualties on the Mamluks, terrified many in their ranks, and disrupted their cavalry charges. As the Mamluks advanced, they faced intense musket fire from the French infantry, who stood firm in their square formations. Despite the ferocity of the Mamluk attacks, the French were able to maintain their defensive formation and repel charge after charge. The divisional square, along with the disciplined use of firearms by the French infantry against the more traditionally armed Mamluks, proved to be the decisive factor in the battle. As the dust settled, Napoleon's troops stood victorious. The successful Egyptian expedition would do more than just claim Cairo. It propelled Napoleon to the pinnacle of French politics. From the sands of Egypt, where things didn't end up going quite as well as Napoleon had hoped, we're going to follow Napoleon back to Europe now, to the plains of northern Italy. The year is 1800, the year before Napoleon had seized supreme power in Paris. He was now first consul of France. Major European powers were now uniting against France, which had become dominant under Napoleon's leadership. Austria, in particular, sought to reclaim its Italian territories, which had been lost to France in previous campaigns. General Michel von Melles led the Austrian army, launching an offensive into northern Italy. Napoleon understood the importance of defeating the Austrians swiftly to maintain French dominance in Western Europe. The two sides would meet at the Battle of Marengo, a battle that swung dramatically, first one way, then the other, a battle that Napoleon always claimed was his finest victory. The morning of June the 14th dawned with a surprise attack by the Austrians. Napoleon's forces were scattered, they were caught off guard, and they teetered on the precipice of defeat. Napoleon himself didn't even arrive on the battlefield until around 11 a.m., and he sent urgent orders for subordinates to bring reinforcements in to stem the Austrian advance. In the early afternoon, the French were being driven back. It looked like a famous victory for the Austrians, but Napoleon's subordinates were now arriving with fresh troops, and showing great composure, he personally led a counterattack. This shocked the Austrians. Caught off guard, the Austrian army began to crumble, and General Melas was forced to order a retreat. By the end of the day, the Austrians abandoned the battlefield, having lost around half their force. Marengo was won. The French emerged victorious yet again, securing a significant and unexpected triumph. In the grander scheme of Napoleon's career, the Battle of Marengo came at a crucial juncture. It reaffirmed Napoleon's military prowess in Europe, and it was a much-needed political victory, one that bolstered his rule in France. The triumph kept his enemies at bay, allowing him to consolidate power and pave the way for the transformation of the French Republic into the Napoleonic Empire. As we continue our voyage through the decisive clashes of Napoleon's wars, we now see one of history's greatest sea battles on the horizon. Five years on from Marengo, we get to the Battle of Trafalgar, a naval engagement whose ripples would be felt throughout the remainder of the wars, and indeed, throughout the rest of the 19th century. This confrontation brought together the world's three great naval powers. Napoleon's fleet was a combination of the French and the Spanish, and against them was the British Royal Navy, under the command of Vice Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson. The British hero of numerous victories, including the Battle of the Nile, where he'd frustrated Napoleon's ambitious plans in the Middle East, and the Battle of Copenhagen, in which he had neutralised the Danish fleet and stopped them supporting Napoleon. The battle was not about capturing enemy territory. It was about maintaining control of the oceans, often a decisive aspect of war. 
Control of the sea allows you to control trade, to access the world's resources, to move troops and supplies around Europe quickly and effectively. In a world without air travel, motorways and railways, rivers and the sea were enormously important. Napoleon Bonaparte's France was seeking to establish hegemony over continental Europe. But the British kept organising and paying for alliances to frustrate his ambitions. And so he decided to strike at Britain itself. His navy would be key. For months, the French and Spanish fleets attempted to give Nelson's ships the slip. But by October 1805, they were blockaded in harbour. Napoleon was frustrated and ordered them to leave the port of Cadiz, to head to sea. They were a combined force of 33 big French and Spanish battleships, ships of the line. Meanwhile, the British fleet, waiting for them off Cape Trafalgar, seized their opportunity and crowded on sail to engage the enemy. Napoleon's armada was larger, but Admiral Nelson, always known for his aggressive tactics, believed it to be less well practiced than the British fleet. He employed an unconventional approach to try and precipitate a truly decisive battle. Rather than steer along in one long line towards the enemy's line, which would allow many of the enemy to escape, he boldly ordered his fleet into two columns, which would both charge directly at the enemy, which was formed in a giant crescent formation. Audaciously, he and his fleet smashed through the enemy lines in two places, which divided them into three isolated units that could then be defeated piecemeal. Nelson wanted a savage close quarters scrap rather than a long range, more traditional duel. He knew that up close, every cannonball would strike an enemy and he gambled that in this kind of melee, it would favor the British because of their superior gunnery and seamanship skills. Ship after ship in the Franco-Spanish fleet became engaged in individual battles with their British counterparts. And the outcome was often a foregone conclusion. The British beat their enemy into submission in these encounters, capturing numerous enemy vessels. Tragically, Admiral Nelson was mortally wounded early in the battle, struck by a musket ball fired from the French ship Redoutable. He died a few hours later, but he lived just long enough to see the tide of battle turning in his favour. His famous last words were, Thank God I have done my duty. Really encapsulate his unwavering dedication to his country and his pursuit of victory at all costs. Despite the loss of their commander, the British fleet continued to press the attack and by late afternoon, the Franco-Spanish ships were in complete disarray. French Admiral Villeneuve surrendered his flagship, the Beau Centure, and another French ship, locked in battle with HMS Victory, was terribly badly damaged and fought until it was overwhelmed by British boarding parties. This picture was repeated with British successes up and down the line. Amid celebrating their victory, the British mourned the death of Nelson. But his demise did not diminish the significance of what the Navy had achieved. British naval domination was decisively confirmed. Napoleon's ambitions to invade Britain dashed for good. Trafalgar is still held up as an example of a crushing one-sided victory. The French and Spanish lost 22 ships. The British, not a single one. Napoleon would have further success on land, but the British maritime grip in and around Europe would eventually wear him down and help contribute to his defeat. Coming on top of other British naval victories, Trafalgar helped to ensure that however many successes Napoleon had on land, he would never win it where it mattered, at sea. Britain's impressive victory at Trafalgar underlined its naval superiority, but Napoleon wasted no time in reasserting his prowess on dry land. Within just two months, he'd won a stunning victory in one of the greatest land battles of the age, the Battle of Austerlitz, known as the Battle of Three Emperors. At Austerlitz, Napoleon, who'd crowned himself emperor the year before, drew Tsar Alexander I of Russia and Emperor Francis II of Austria into a climactic showdown. This was probably Napoleon's greatest battle. His strategic and tactical brilliance has been studied ever since. In the months leading up to the battle, he had manoeuvred his army brilliant, driving his enemies before him deep into Eastern Europe. But then as December approached, he knew he needed to win a crushing victory before the onset of winter. And to do so, he let his enemies think he was weak, he was starving, he was desperate to return to France. 
even sent out a peace envoy. He also withdrew his men from a big plateau, a piece of high ground called the Pratson Heights, which lured his enemy into a trap. They immediately sent troops to occupy the Pratson Heights and felt confident that Napoleon was a beaten man. He also ordered his right wing to be left deliberately weak, so the Allies would focus their attention on that part of the battlefield. And sure enough, on the morning of the Battle of Austerlitz, the Allies focused their assaults on Napoleon's right wing. As the Allies pushed forward, the French launched a devastating counterattack, stunning their opponents. Out of the morning mists, a massive French assault seized the Pratson Heights, and this split the Allied forces in half. With the Austrian and the Russian center punctured, Napoleon had his enemy divided. French forces threw themselves against either Allied flank. As the day progressed, the French piled on the pressure. Napoleon personally directed the artillery, which played a devastating role in breaking the enemy's will to fight. The French cavalry, led by Marshal Joachim Morin, also played a crucial role in sowing chaos in Allied lines. By the late afternoon, the situation for the Allies had become untenable. The Russian and Austrian troops, exhausted and demoralized, could no longer hold their ground. The Russians and the Austrians ordered a retreat, which soon turned into a chaotic rout as the French pursued them relentlessly. And Napoleon ordered his artillery to fire on some frozen ponds over which Allied troops were retreating. Thousands of Allied soldiers were taken prisoner. It was a humiliating, catastrophic defeat. Austerlitz was a victory that resounded across Europe. Napoleon had not only defeated an army, he vanquished two emperors. The battle showcased his military brilliance. It reaffirmed his dominance over Europe. The repercussions were immediate and far-reaching. He extended his direct rule over parts of Central Europe. He dissolved the thousand-year-old Holy Roman Empire. Austerlitz was Napoleon's masterpiece, its memory inspiring admiration in his acolytes and terror in his enemy. We're now heading northwards to the rolling hills of Thuringia in Germany. The year is 1806, a mere year after the stunning French victory at Austerlitz. The next pivotal battle, or more accurately battles, are the twin confrontations that took place simultaneously at Jena and Auerstadt. These clashes pitted the ascendant French Empire under the command of Napoleon against the Kingdom of Prussia. Now, at that time, the German world was divided between dozens of small states, but chief among them was probably Prussia, which dominated the north and east. In the years leading up to the battle, tensions between France and Prussia had been escalating. Napoleon had swept across Europe, and he was seeking to consolidate his dominance. Although Prussia had traditionally been a leading military power in Europe, by the time of the jena auerstadt battles, it was struggling to keep pace with the tactical and organizational revolution of Napoleonic warfare. Prussia feared Napoleon. They didn't trust him. He made peaceful overtures to Prussia, but he also boosted Prussian rivals within Germany. For example, Napoleon created the Confederation of the Rhine, a military alliance with small West German states, with Napoleon as its hereditary protector. This looked like an attempt to isolate and subordinate Prussia. The Prussians declared war. It was a terrible mistake. Napoleon led a battle-hardened army into Germany. He wanted to draw the Prussians into a decisive battle which would quickly and completely destroy them. By mid-October, Napoleon pounced on a Prussian force at Jena, one of Napoleon's generals, Marshal Ney, attacked too soon. He became surrounded and endangered Napoleon's entire position. But the emperor redeployed reserves and sent in troops to rescue his hot-headed subordinate. Then Napoleon ordered two flanking attacks. The Prussians realized the danger and retreated. It was a victory. But what made it a decisive one? It was that simultaneously a battle was unfolding some miles to the north at Auerstadt, where the corps commanded by French Marshal Louis-Nicolas Davout stumbled across the main Prussian force, led by the Duke of Brunswick, which was twice the size of Davout's army. Unperturbed, the French attacked and routed the Prussians, who made a series of bad decisions and used their cavalry poorly. The two senior Prussian commanders on the field lost their lives, which added to Prussian chaos. Napoleon captured the capital of Prussia, Berlin, a few days later. In just 19 days, he'd smashed the Prussian army and occupied its capital. Jena Auerstadt humiliated Prussia, 
and the Prussians were forced to hand over around half of their territory in the subsequent Treaty of Tilsit. France now dominated Germany, further bolstering Napoleon's control over continental Europe. Jena Auerstadt really showed off the fact that France's war machine had a huge lead over the other nations of Europe. Not for a thousand years had one man dominated so much of Europe as Napoleon Bonaparte did in the years that followed Jena Auerstadt. His empire was impressive, but it would be short-lived. It's 1812 and Napoleon has marched a huge force of 700,000 soldiers into Russia. The Russians attempted a strategy, mostly of avoiding pitch battles and retreating deeper into Russian territory, sucking the French in, wearing them down, using a scorched earth policy to deny them supplies. But at Borodino, a small town 70 miles west of Moscow, the Russian army decided to finally square up to the French Grande Armée. The French forces were under the command of Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and they smashed into the Russian army led by Mikhail Kutuzov. The goal was Moscow, the political heart of Russia. Napoleon sought one of his decisive victories to force Russia into a peace treaty, but the Battle of Borodino was far from decisive. The two armies collided in a hideous storm of artillery, cavalry and infantry. Men advanced over fields of corpses. Napoleon, usually known for his tactical brilliance, opted for an unsubtle, direct, brutal frontal assault resulting in enormous loss of life. The French would lose around a third of their army, nearly 30,000 men in a single day. The Russians, determined, resilient, fought with equal ferocity and suffered similarly shocking numbers of casualties. One of the most infamous features of the battle was the Russian defence of the Raevsky Redoubt, a fortified position that changed hands several times during the day. The intense fighting at the redoubt became a symbol of Russian resistance. The battle was the most bloody single day battle of the Napoleonic Wars. By the end of the day, nearly 70,000 men had been killed or wounded. In fact, it was one of the most bloody single days in military history until the advent of the First World War. Though Kutuzov eventually ordered a retreat, the Russian army remained largely intact. Napoleon had won the battlefield, but it was not the decisive victory he needed. He marched on Moscow, occupied it, but that didn't yield the expected Russian capitulation either. Instead, it marked the beginning of a disastrous retreat that would decimate the Grande Armée. As the French advanced further into Russia, they found their supply lines stretched thin and their troops hungry, demoralized by the harsh conditions and lack of provisions. Winter was approaching now. Moscow had burnt to the ground. It was in ruins. There was no decisive victory to be had. Napoleon was forced to turn around and begin a disastrous retreat out of Russia. That retreat proved catastrophic for Napoleon's Grande Armée. With the brutal Russian winter, the lack of supplies, the constant harassment from Russian forces, all that led to a near total destruction of Napoleon's army. By the time he left Russia, Napoleon had far fewer than 100,000 men out of his original force of several hundred thousand. In the grand story of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Borodino stood as a stark reminder of the limits of battlefield victory. And it marked the beginning of the end for Napoleon, the point at which the tide turned against him. Napoleon's defeat in Russia in 1812 had brought the fighting back to the heart of Germany. It's now 1813 and the Napoleonic Wars have entered a phase of terrible defeats for the French Empire. Arguably, the event that best captures this shift of fortunes is the Battle of Leipzig, also known as the Battle of the Nations. This titanic clash was the culmination of the struggle between the French Empire, led by Napoleon Bonaparte, and a formidable coalition comprising of Russia, Prussia, Austria, Sweden and Britain. The scale of the confrontation was unprecedented, making Leipzig one of the largest battles of the Napoleonic era and of history to that point. Napoleon, still a master tactician, was faced with overwhelming odds. The Allied forces, seeking to liberate Germany from French control and break Napoleon's hold over Europe, outnumbered the French significantly. The battle lasted for four relentless days, each side throwing everything they had into the fray. On the first day, October the 16th, the coalition forces launched attacks on Napoleon's positions but unable to break through. 
The second day saw fierce fighting as both sides clashed in and around the city of Leipzig itself. Napoleon's forces defended tenaciously, but the coalition gradually gained ground. By the third day, October the 18th, the pressure on Napoleon intensified as his troops were stretched thin. Meanwhile, more coalition reinforcements were arriving, including Swedish forces under Crown Prince Bernadotte, who had formerly been a French marshal under Napoleon. The coalition had numerical superiority and was able to encircle and isolate portions of the French army. On the fourth day, October the 19th, the battle reached a climax. Desperate to break the encirclement, Napoleon launched a massive counterattack. However, the coalition's coordinated efforts and the exhaustion of the French troops turned the tide decisively against him. A disastrous rout of the French army ensued, marking a decisive victory for the coalition. The Battle of Leipzig was more than a military defeat for Napoleon. His aura of invincibility, tarnished by the Russian campaign the year before, was now destroyed for good. It marked a dramatic shift in the balance of power for Europe. It led inexorably to Napoleon's defeat, his abdication and exile the following year. It was the beginning of the end of the French Empire. Leipzig stands as a stark turning point. It's probably the most important battle in the downfall of Napoleon Bonaparte. It's now 1815. The year before, Napoleon was defeated. He abdicated, had gone into exile. But in 1815, he has launched one last desperate attempt to return to power against all the odds. His first test is just outside a small village in what is now Belgium at the Battle of Ligny. This engagement, the first of the tumultuous so-called Hundred Days which followed Napoleon's escape from exile in Elba, was a success. It was a victory, but it would be Napoleon's last. Napoleon, who had seized back the crown following his escape from Elba, faced a renewed coalition of adversaries. Spanish, Portuguese, Brits, Dutch, an array of Germans, Austrians and Russians. He struck first, north towards Brussels. His troops were confronted by Prussian forces under the command of Field Marshal Gepard Lebrecht von Blücher. Napoleon wanted to separate the Prussians from the British Dutch armies, defeat them in detail and then turn to face his other enemies who were approaching from Central Europe. At the outset of the battle, Napoleon's forces numbered around 70,000 troops, while Blücher's Prussian army had around 50,000 soldiers. The battle began with a brutal assault by French forces on Prussian positions. Despite a spirited defence and fierce counterattacks, the Prussians were finally forced to retreat under the relentless pressure of Napoleon's troops. Blücher himself was injured during the battle, but continued to issue orders from his carriage. Although Ligny was a victory for Napoleon, it was not the decisive triumph he'd hoped for. Crucially, Napoleon failed to pursue the retreating Prussians aggressively, allowing them to regroup and march to the help of their allies, the British Dutch army. This strategic misstep would prove fatal in the battle that followed, the infamous Battle of Waterloo. Our journey through the tumultuous saga of the revolutionary Napoleonic Wars reaches a dramatic climax now with the Battle of Waterloo. Coming just after Napoleon's victory at Ligny, Waterloo snuffed out any chance at all that Napoleon's brief, stirring resurgence might actually end up with him dominating France and Europe as before. The French army under Emperor Napoleon marched north after its victory over the Prussians at Ligny. And just outside the village of Waterloo, it had found the British and Allied army commanded by the Duke of Wellington, guarding the approach to Brussels. Terrible rain and thick mud caused a critical delay to Napoleon's attack. He wanted to swap the Allied army aside before the Prussians could reorganise and march to their aid. Throughout the afternoon, though, Napoleon launched blow after blow against Wellington's men. But they were narrowly and bloodily repulsed. Throughout that terrible day, both sides suffered heavy casualties and the outcome hung in the balance. Napoleon's fiery Marshal Ney ordered repeated cavalry attacks against Wellington but the Allies held their ground, famously forming squares to repel the horsemen. This tenacity brought valuable time for the coalition forces as Blücher's Prussian army marched steadily towards the battlefield. The tide turned in the late afternoon with the arrival of those Prussians. The French were now fighting in two different directions, pressed from two sides, and French forces faltered. A desperate last charge by Napoleon's elite Imperial Guard failed to break through British lines, marking the end for French forces 
A chaotic retreat ensued, culminating in a comprehensive final defeat for Napoleon. The Battle of Waterloo wasn't merely the end of a battle, it was the end of an era. Napoleon was exiled once more, this time as a prisoner to the remote island of St Helena where he'd live out the rest of his days. The map of Europe was redrawn and the continent entered a period of relative peace. The effects of these wars on France was enormous. People estimate that French losses could be up to 3 million dead. According to one historian, David Gates, the Napoleonic Wars alone cost France around a million men from 1803 to 1815. This represents one third of the conscription class of the early 1790s. It's thought that in total across all belligerent nations, something like 7 million people were killed in the conflict. The scale of that destruction would not be seen again for almost a century until the outbreak of the First World War. Hi everybody, I'm Dan Snow and I'm guessing that if you're watching this, then you, like me, are fascinated by the life of Napoleon. From his early years as an ambitious young military officer, using his tactical genius and specialist knowledge of artillery during the siege of Toulon, all the way through to his crushing defeat at the mighty Battle of Waterloo. And it's these battles and much more that has been gloriously captured in the upcoming film release, Napoleon, in cinemas from the 22nd of November. I really can't recommend it enough. So get out there and watch this epic film on the biggest screen you can find as soon as possible.